you know, in the longevity economy, it's likely that at 60, we'll live, we'll live 25 to 30 years. Yeah. And so my perfect, my sweet spot with my client is that 25 to 30 years. Like, what are you going to do with your 25 or 30 to make a difference? Yeah. And yeah. Um, I love that space because so many people are wanting to do more, you know, to done with that or continue, but in a different um, offering, meaning I want to work two days or three days, whatever, and I want to travel more, whatever it is, so on their terms, or you know, to be able to um, completely reinvent yourself. So I guess um, the alignment is that I've been designing lives for, or designing interiors for all these years, and I'm using the same technology to design lives. And it's really quite interesting, because if I were helping you with your home, I would first come here, you know, have the interview, ask you a thousand questions, as my boys would say, and then, you know, do all the documentation, all the necessary work. If you're designing lives, you still have to have all that data and that input. They have to do some pretty deep work to say, who am I? What do I want to do? And so many people just don't know. Just like when I come into a home, many people have no idea what to do. So they're leaning on you to guide them through the process. And it is simply a design process. And I've really gotten very excited about it because a design process is something that you see a beginning, a middle, and an end. It's a journey, and there's an outcome. So if you want to design and live the life you love, these are some steps that you could take. Yeah, and I think mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that's you know, there's a few areas where we clearly mm -hmm. are well-connected, and that's the mm -hmm. one that you touch on, which I think is why people invite you in, is mm -hmm. it's just hard for a lot of people to imagine anything beyond what yeah. they know today. Yeah. And and they really do need somebody, because mm -hmm. there's a lot of trust involved, right? Mm -hmm. That's the, mm -hmm. that for me is when you, you find the right match on a client, it's, right. there's a, there's an element of trust that, yeah. that, Trusted uh, advisors. that you're sharing yeah. you know, together on yeah. that journey, because yeah. without it, it's going to be a, it's going to be a, a difficult haul. journey, right? Yeah. And I, I like to start with a vision or an outcome, you know. So in my case, I wanted to go to France for 30 days. That was a vision that I had had for a long time. And I just wrote about this yesterday, yesterday for 60 and Me. But it's, um, you know, it was in November that I said, you know, I'm not allowing myself to, to dream big. You know, I had this dream, but it was so far down on my bucket list, I just kept, you know relegating it to the bottom because it just seems so complicated. How can I leave my company for 30 days? How can I do this? How can I do that? And um, so, but when I started with that dream and I said, I want to do that, then the rest was, okay, we'll figure out how to do it. You know, so starting here, so starting here, what is this house going to look like? The vision. And once they can get, so we always have created what I call the magic of three, a minimum of three design boards. So here's what this could look like, or here's what it could look like. And so there's a connection there. I really like that. I like that. And then we do revisions. And so we now have a solid vision of what we want this to look like. What do you want your life to look like? You know, I want to travel more. I want to, you know, be closer to my kids. Whatever they want to do, that's their vision. And then we'll figure out how. Yeah, the... So, so, so back in. Yeah, <laughs> so as you talk about that, like, like I see a lot of people have a hard time even imagining... A different physical environment, even mm -hmm. within the existing walls. Yeah. Um, imagining a different life, mm -hmm. uh, I would think mm. people are, that is that's even more abstract. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. so probably, although they're obviously you know, reaching out because they clearly recognize they want to change. So, so maybe that's a good spot to, to okay. kind of drill in a little bit. Is there's often some, and it's the same when I look at it from longevity. Is there's often some some demarcation of some life event mm -hmm. that has caused them to change. What, what sort of changes do you see people um, mm. running into? That uh, Well, those, those could be life stages. They could be life circumstances. Um, so life stages would be um, empty nest. You know, so empty nest, we really want this big house anymore. It could be pre-retirement. You know, we're thinking about a smaller house. It could be retirement where this house is way too big. I'm out of here. Um, and it could be um, life circumstances, which are more of divorce, 
death in, death in the family. Um, it could be health and, and illnesses, um, sometimes sudden and sometimes serious, and we have to do something quickly. And then another one would be um, financial um, situations that, you know, someone's lost a job, they can't afford this anymore. So those, we kind of look at that, and, and for me, and I always start, I like, I'm glad we're starting here, because I think um, when you are looking at how can you design a life that you love, which is basically lifestyle design, you, it's, it's a journey. Some people, it does happen right away. You know, there's a heart attack or a stroke or someone lost a job. That's immediate. But there are others that are more elongated, and so it's a journey. And people, um, it's, it's a struggle. So I ask them to start listening and noticing, paying attention to what are you longing for and what are you complaining about. So when you're complaining about, this house is too big, or I don't want to do yard work anymore, or when you're yearning for, I really wish I had a simpler life. I wish I didn't have to do this anymore. That's the beginning of this journey. And when you start letting that deep sink down into who you are, it's really quite interesting to see then, because then the conversation is different. You know, and sometimes you have a husband on this side and a wife on that side. You know, well, I don't want to move. Well, I do want to move. So what do you do then? You know, and, and my brother was that. He was a banker in Boston. His wife had retired several years earlier. And for th three years, we whispered in his ear. And one day, he's, he just looked around and said, you know, what do you think? This, is, this house is really pretty big. <laughs> so, you know, when it comes from yeah. that mouth, it, it, was, it was so much easier. And they downsized, and they've never been happier. Yeah, it's a, mm -hmm. yeah, I ran into mm -hmm. the same thing. Mm -hmm. and, and so where I see it, you run into this risk of what I call paralysis, partner paralysis, yeah. is that partner paralysis, um, yeah. he, there's something, some mm -hmm. event usually has to happen to intervene. Mm -hmm. um, maybe from, if we think about the physical space where somebody physically wants to downsize, um, certainly the, um, the economics around that are, mm -hmm. are, are, they can be daunting, right? Because it costs a lot to move, mm -hmm. that you're, you're not, you're not going to get that back in the short term. So as I look at it, um, without having looked too deeply, it, it says to me that if you're going to downsize, you need to really downsize. Just doing a 10% or 15%, mm -hmm. you, you're probably not going to gain a lot. It probably says right. you really need to go in with, uh, yeah. I, 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 I'm a background as a boater. You can't have one foot on the dock and one foot on the boat for very long. <laughs> you <laughs> better okay. decide. You're either yeah. going to get in or you're not yeah. Um, yeah. because it's... Yeah. Uh, otherwise, you go through all the same uh, experience, but probably not much return. It reminds me of if you're sewing. You sew a big dress or a little dress. It's all the same amount of work, just a little more fabric. If you're doing a big renovation or a small renovation, it's the same amount of work, same steps, just a little more money or a little more space. Um, so conversely, if you're downsizing, um, it's really important to discern that if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it. <laughs> yeah. Now, mine was rather radical. I downsized um, by 95%. And yet, I've never been happier, but I was so ready to get rid of the big house, the yard, all the, all the stuff that goes along with that. And it has changed my life, which is why I speak about that today. Not everyone wants to be that radical. But, you know, when the average home size, <clears throat> you know, is, is around 2,500 square feet, you just start to ask questions about, you know, what is your lifestyle like? And there's two of you, you know, one's retired, one's not. They like their space. Maybe it's a second marriage. So would a one-bedroom apartment work for you? Probably not. Um, Two-bedroom apartment, maybe. One floor, because one's starting to have some arthritis, so one floor versus two floors. Those are the questions, and you start to winnow down you know, what would make sense? And so then we actually plot in, a, let's say it's a 1,200-square-foot a space, two bedrooms, you know, open area like that. We plot in furniture to say, you know, here's your furniture, you know, maybe not the bigger things, but the smaller things that you said you really wanted to keep. And if we plotted that in, what would that look like? And is this satisfactory? Well, I need a library. 
Okay, well, then maybe we need a third bedroom. You know, so those are the kind of things that we go back and forth. And, you know, we can do it with great confidence because we've done it all of our lives for 35 years, been designing spaces. So when I say this is going to look great and it's going to fit, I know it will. And then there may be some empty spaces to say, you know, when you live in a smaller space, you want more, you might want more flex furniture. So things that have multi-purpose. Um, they don't have any of that. So it starts to show up as voids and okay, well that can be added in. But um, you can have the lifestyle that you're wanting um, by living in a smaller space and it can actually be a better lifestyle because you don't then have the maintenance of the three-car garage and the yard and all of that. Um, you know, many people that move to a 55 and older community, um, they don't want the maintenance anymore, but they've still got a little bit of a yard so they can play with that. Um, you know, they might have a two-car garage, they might have a lofted area, but they basically live on one level. So all of this is just um, <laughs> the psychology of how we live, how we live, how we work, how we play. And that space, once you determine what your unique lifestyle is, and, and we can do that together, you can do it independent of, of us, um, it's very easy to say it's time. Yeah, it, um, uh, it, like you, I guess, um, I've traveled a fair bit and I grew up outside America. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things I think w where we get in trouble here is, is we've, we've been raised in this notion of the bigger the better, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and, and you start to realize when you've had different experiences exactly the freedom that comes with, with mm -hmm. that, that you suddenly have more time, and I, I've absolutely lived that, mm -hmm. where you suddenly have more time to do whatever it is you want to do. I, I had that in my, um, in my 40s, and I really, that's when I got into endurance athletics. Mm. Well, and when you're training 25 hours a week and <laughs> you don't have a lot of energy left for everything else, you know, keeping up a house is, is just, One more know, thing. it's okay for a mm -hmm. hobby, mm -hmm. but as soon as it's more than a hobby, it just, you just didn't have time or energy for mm -hmm. it. So it, uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, so, it, and, I, and I look at a lot of these things to say, is this a forever decision, mm -hmm. right? So, so mm -hmm. in this example, if you're interested in trying it, it doesn't mean you can't go back and to the bigger house if you wanted to, if Absolutely. you decided in five yeah. years, you know, yeah. you didn't, yeah. it, it wasn't working for you. At least you'll, you'll put to bed that, you know, that nagging comp complaining yeah. in your in your mind about yeah. thinking you wanted something um and again so that's the motivation to do it earlier right where mm -hmm. um, i think in all of this is how do you get activated the sooner you do it the sooner you get to experience it the sooner mm -hmm. you, you you gain your freedom mm -hmm. um, so i think here's a perfect example um <clears throat> when people are thinking about retirement i strongly encourage them to put their toe in the water. So that's why you see people going to Charleston or to Florida, you know, and maybe for one week and then a two week and then they rent for a month. That's putting your toe in the water. Like, what would it be like to live here? Um, in my world, we call it prototyping lifestyle. Now, when you go for one week, that's certainly not enough to, right. to gather. But if you start liking an area like Charleston, and you find yourself, you know, every quarter wanting to go there for another week or another week or another week. And then maybe maybe next year, should we try it in the summer, see what it's like there. Um, when you prototype lifestyle, um, you can put your toe in the water. Another way to, another thing to consider, and baby boomers are certainly considering this now, is to rather than buy rent. So you, you don't have the same long-term commitment. Now, you know, there has been a mindset in America um, a stigma, so to speak, of renting versus buying. I'm renting for the first time ever since college. And I have all the flexibility, mobility, and lack of responsibility, <laughs> um, which is something I'm kind of cherishing right now. So when, when you have less that you actually own, you do have more time, more money, more freedom. So living in Philadelphia, you would think it would be far more expensive. It's not. I, I save a lot of money by living living in Philadelphia, which is just amazing to me. I, you know, I did some numbers, and, but I didn't quite expect what I save every month. And it all had to do with the amount of maintenance, the, the taxes, and all kinds of things. So you do have to analyze, you know, w would this make sense? 
Yeah, I, so, so in my downtown mm-hmm. experience, mm-hmm. Um, what, what sh- so the handyman who's happy to do all these things, mm-hmm. um, I remember moving in, so I was renting for a couple of years, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and I remember a, a leaking tap that was just, <laughs> you know, one of those annoying yeah. drip, 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 yeah. and I didn't have any of my tools or anything, right. I left them, uh, right. all, everything was in storage, and I remember calling to get somebody to come up and do it, and he was up, you know, apologizing, it wasn't going to be an hour perhaps an hour till he could get there. <laughs> and I remember thinking, wow, <laughs> that's it. And yeah. you know, five minutes. Yeah. I, I know. It I was know. a, that, that, yeah. that was pretty early on. And I remember uh-huh. thinking, this uh-huh. is, this is not all bad. Uh-huh. And yeah. And, uh-huh. and with renting, you know uh-huh. what, what your costs are. So from a planning standpoint, yeah. there yeah. are no big surprises of, oh, the roof is leaking or, you know, right. we've got water in the basement. Right. What are we going to do now? This wasn't in our, you know, we, we can't possibly put all those things in our budgeting. We, we kind of in our mind allocate something, but with mm-hmm. renting, mm-hmm. so for anyone I would think where they're really trying to manage their, their, uh, their living costs, mm-hmm. um, it's a, and probably, so with renting, I guess that's also in my, my experience, it depends a lot on where you are. Certainly some places right. have far better options right. um, than others. And I would, I would look at, at this specific area and say, not a lot of opportunities for what I would call quality renting to the point of I've thought about putting up some buildings yeah. <laughs> uh, or converting some area. old mansions yeah. into uh, yeah. into s- some multi-unit buildings. But, um, but well, certainly lots of areas. I think you know. baby boomers are certainly, um, you know, and we're, we're learning a lot from our kids, right? So I've had two sons who have lived in major cities, um, a good part of, of their young adult life. And um, what's interesting is, is that they... That lifestyle, you know, is very attractive. And so baby boomers became attracted to that kind of lifestyle where you just walk everywhere. And there's so much culture. There's just so many activities. You could wear yourself out, literally. Now, it's kind of interesting, too, to see the movement of baby boomers, uh, not baby, excuse me, millennials, moving back to a second-tier city, third-tier city, because now they're ready to start their, their families. So, you know, life is... A lot of seasons and so baby boomers we're in a season of our life we've you know maybe had the big house we've had the yard we've moved a lot we've accumulated a lot and now what do we want and that's the, that's where we are right now is um we have the ability to actually many of us have the ability to say this is the kind of lifestyle i want and and we have choices and so it seems to me that if you want a high quality of life, to spend time on what kind of lifestyle do you want? So for me, I was very fortunate to um, you know, have a big house. I built it and loved it for 10 years and then went to Senegal to visit my son and realized this big house is not who I am anymore. And I looked around and none of it looked the same. So over a period of a few years, I downsized. And I was very fortunate because I... I had something happen in my life that changed me forever. Um, not everyone does, but, but I think when you just become curious about, my kids are gone, you know, this house is pretty big, that room is never used, um, you know, they used to play in the basement, they don't do that anymore, we don't need the three-car garage. So just to start making sense of some of this stuff. So when you start hearing yourself say, it makes sense for us to move, and, you know, then have that conversation. Um, that could be aging. You know, it, it could be it makes sense because um, we've got two, two floors here and a single floor makes much more sense. It could um, be a conversation about, you know, it's time. You know, I, I'm divorced, I'm widowed, um, I'm retiring. Do we really need all this anymore? Another kind of conversation you might start hearing yourself say is, um, you know, I'm ready for a simpler life. I'm ready to travel more. I'm ready to move near my grandchildren. Um, those are or, or the things that, you know, I want. I want to travel more. I, so you just start listening to this. And then you also would listen to, you know, I don't want. I, this neighborhood's just too big for us anymore. You know, it was great when we had kids. So that's the lifestyle conversations that um, we start to have with people. And that's how they ultimately determine, should we move or should we stay? 
And then if they say, well, they want to stay, well, then how can we um, look at this house for you to actually age in place and um, enjoy this house for as long as you possibly can and be safe? And most houses are adaptable um, to that. Many are, it's going to be pretty expensive, so then you want to weigh that as well. Because certainly there are more and more options out there of single floor living. But again, it all has to do with just thinking it through before you before you do it. Yeah, the um, yeah. For, for, so so it all kind of comes back. To, a lot of it is some real planning in terms of mm-hmm. um, but planning isn't just kind of mm-hmm. keep doing what you're doing. Um, and so if, if we <clears throat> and so if we look at it, um, you know, I try to get people into like five, ten, fifteen year thought process depending on where you are in that um, and that can range from you know perhaps it's early in the in the retirement phase well you want time to travel well when are you planning to deal with the house would you know, mm-hmm. are you, that's going to be harder if you're planning to travel if, if uh, so you mm-hmm. could imagine you know, the, the two options of, of having a rental versus a sure. a big home yeah. while you travel for away for weeks or potentially months at a time um, but then the other is if you can look at later and say, well, and, and this probably goes more at the men, is um, how am I going to care for my wife you know, if something were to happen to me? Am I going to leave that all for her to deal with? Mm-hmm. And I, I really try to encourage people to kind of think about what would be the responsible choice to make. And I, mm. don't, I don't mean responsible, mean making sacrifices. It would mean um, how can I help my partner in this mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, to avoid the, uh, you know, the stress that, Mm-hmm. That, that would clearly be honest, but at the same time, experience a different lifestyle than we've been used to. Because it's really in in my work um, in discussions with people, the default is always just keep doing what you're doing, and mm-hmm. and unfortunately until a crisis occurs, right? Yeah. So yeah, so yeah. so here's the well, in, say in, in operations we call it run to failure. Well, mm-hmm. you know, businesses don't operate very well in a run to failure mode, and neither do lifestyles. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Right, so if you mm-hmm. if you do some some planning, um, you can certainly create much different outcomes. So so the, so the default is keep we're going to keep doing what we're doing until we can't. Right. And of course, at that point, you're now in a corner, and your options are going to be much fewer. And now you're going to be making crisis decisions mm-hmm. as opposed to lifestyle decisions. Right. Yeah. yeah. Now, the same is true. Um, we're now kind of shifting gears a little bit to all of that stuff that we've accumulated. And when you think about, I mean, I can speak for myself, you know, I had 5,000 square foot home. The average American, according to a a study at University of California, the average American has 300,000 items in their home. I'm sure I was probably double that. And what didn't occur to me as I was doing it or until I was doing it, I should say, is how much stuff I had accumulated over all of those years. So you've probably heard of Swedish death cleaning. And it's a kind and compassionate thing that we can do for our children. So if we downsize now or declutter now, our kids won't have to do it when something happens to us. And every single day I run into someone who said, oh, you know, their mom or dad had a stroke, and now we're scrambling to see where will they live, and oh, my God, we've got the house. What do we do with the house? You know, and oh, my God, the stuff. I hear that every single day. And I think, you know, as speaking of responsible, I think it's responsible of us to take time now to start decluttering. And there are some methods that can actually be kind of fun. You know, and that's to invite your kids in for a, you know, Saturday morning coffee and just walk through the house and ask them to say, I want that and I don't want that. Write it down. And what that does is it gives you the freedom to let go of that because there's an emotional, very strong emotional component to downsizing and letting go of all of this stuff because you become attached to that. So that cabinet that was given to you by your great, great grandmother, your kids may say, I don't want that. And you know, even though it may hurt for a moment to hear that, you suddenly are free to get rid of that. And if your kids aren't going to want it, and if you basically can't sell it, you're going to give it away. And even those places are getting full. (laughs) They can't take any more baby boomer stuff. So we really have to think about what we can do now 
to downsize, declutter, and to make room for the life that we really want. Yeah, the uh, again, I'm sure you see it too. And, and I see the two extremes. Um, I, I go into some people's homes who have done a phenomenal job of decluttering. Mm-hmm. And in, when you go in the house, it is immediately, it's so relaxing. Yeah. They're relaxed. You know, they're living a, a simple life in terms of they're not mm-hmm. managing stuff. Yeah. And then have the other extreme where they're you know, navigating through yeah. the boxes of things that, and of course, once you get behind, then it really mm-hmm. just becomes mm-hmm. you know, harder and harder. So, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. yeah, so in, in some of those people, they need to get help with decluttering because mm-hmm. it's just not in their nature. Mm-hmm. They'll find an excuse to keep everything. Yeah. Right. Um, but ultimately, you know, it's the walls just literally start to uh, mm-hmm. start moving in on them. I think you also want to think about how it's impacting the quality of your life. We had a client recently, um, we, we have a downsizing service, and we actually go in and we help people declutter, downsize, and get rid of. And um, <clears throat> and it's, it's a strategy and a methodology that we've used that really works. But <clears throat> this one woman called and she said, Rita, we own three houses. And the two smaller houses were very, very happy, and it's this big house that every time I'm here, I never feel comfortable. There's so much stuff. So I said, well, we'll start there. And so week by week, we you know, would go to her home, and we would slowly but surely start getting rid of some of that stuff until now it is decluttered, and she said she loves that home too. Um, at some point, she'll probably start getting rid of some of her homes. <laughs> But um, it's amazing how clutter impacts the quality of our life. And um, it, you know, so it's, it's not just the physical clutter, it's the mental clutter. And when, when we start, um, you know, saying, well, I, I, I can't move because I don't know how, I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, all of those things we tell ourselves or, you know, starting and then stopping and coming right back to square one, never really completing what, what you've started... Those are all the things that are cluttering our minds as well as our physical spaces. And, you know, when you think, if I didn't have that, what would my life be like? Be simpler and be happier and, um, and freer. Yeah, so. so you've touched on, again, another area mm-hmm. where I think mm-hmm. um, where we see in the space is that people don't put enough personal value Mm-hmm. On, on what their lives are and, and that they really do matter in ways that they tend to discount. Mm-hmm. And so they think that, you know, well, I'll focus on the children or the grandchildren. Um, I don't want to, you know, upset things here too much. Uh, and it's a process of steadily kind of discounting until it shows up in self-esteem. Yeah. And what I would hate to think for anybody is, could you imagine, you know, in the later part of your life kind of feeling like you hadn't done things that you really truly wanted to do or wanted to try. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. that being bold uh, and yeah. trying some things early. And and it, it's, it, it, uh, have you run into where families are maybe not supporting of, of, uh, of their parents uh, d- downsizing? and Because and, that can be you know, oh, yeah. a psychological uh, barrier. There are so many emotional aspects of downsizing and one is that the kids this is where we grew up how can you get rid of our house yeah or the the on a smaller scale how can you get rid of all of my trophies in my bedroom i mean you've only been gone for five years <laughs> i hear that one yeah. all the time yeah. um so I, I laugh about it because it is kind of a funny conversation but it's real to some absolutely and i mean for for me i had a very large home in a very large basement so whenever my boys would move and one was particularly good at moving um stuff from the previous apartment will come to my basement. So at some point I said, okay, my basement is not going to be your storage facility anymore. <laughs> um, there, there was, what do you mean? You know, well, I'm going to be downsizing. You're going to have to get rid of the stuff. So there, there is a point in time where you have to just say enough. Um, and, and, you know, the whole idea of saying goodbye to your stuff is, or saying goodbye to your home Those are some of the emotional components. Um, You know, you love your neighborhood. You love your neighbors. You know, you've got your special coffee shop or whatever it is. Um, Letting go of that, the memories that were accumulated over a period of time. Um, So whether you're letting go of your family home, your neighborhood, your neighbors, um, the stuff, you know, the tangible stuff has memories. You know, for me, believe it or not, my son's soccer shorts 
from Marchmere, I held on to those for a long, long time. And when he said, I can't believe you're holding on to those, but it was my memory of that time of my life. I didn't want to let go of that. Or those little picture frames of the macaroni that your kids give you. You know, I found that in one of my boxes. And there was that little tinge of, oh, I remember that, you know, or I remember my son giving me this note as he's going off to college. Those are the kind of things that people deal with when they downsize. It is emotional, but they can certainly get through it. Um, you know, so other things that are quite emotional when you're, when you're, you know, downsizing is not knowing if you're going to make the right decision. So, you know, should I downsize? Should I right size? Should I, and, you know, we had that conversation before, you know, some people move two or three times because they didn't get it right. We hope to help prevent that because that could get extremely expensive. Um, it all begins like, what kind of lifestyle do I want? You know, I'm now an empty nester. I, um, you know, my kids are grown. They're happy. What do we want to do or what do I want to do? So you start asking yourself these deeper questions that will impact you. And, um, you know, people are concerned, you know, well, where? I mean, should I move here? Should I move to a city? Should I move to whatever? And, um, and then the other one is, should I stay or should I go? You know, should I renovate this space and make it, you know, adapt for me as I age? Those are, those are just a few of the things. And then, of course, the other thing with, with downsizing um, of any kind or decluttering is the upheaval. You know, so for me, it took one year to downsize my home. So I had a little bit of a strategy, and that would be every Saturday or Sunday for four hours, would you come and help me? And so I made um, many, many um, great memories with friends and family, and then we would go eat or drink. You know, but it was just four hours, so it was limited, but every week there was progress. Um, so, but the upheaval is, is pretty overwhelming to most people, and um, how long can you really put up with that? But do you do it now, or do you wait? You know, and when there's a crisis, you have to do it. But what would you think of doing it sooner than later? Right, and, and with, <clears throat> with a lot of this, I think it's, it's the getting started is the hardest part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. again, I can look at my own example. We have four houses collapsed into one through, yeah. you know, through various family changes, through uh, you know, parents with two homes, and it all ended up here. Um, and we have consciously been been working at it, but it's a when you look at it, it is a daunting task. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the only thing more daunting yeah. is imagining looking at it in five years from now, realizing yeah, that true. nothing would have changed. That's true. Um, and sometimes it's you, know, you you can get a dumpster dropped off for a week and have a you know a couple of weekend parties and mm -hmm. you know because there's bigger things where you know mm -hmm. bring bringing family in mm -hmm. can help with it in all sorts of ways because mm -hmm. it's a it can be a lonely process so it sounds like you know just having someone with you to go through it I would think would be emotionally very helpful. <laughs> it's funny, you know I've I've run big projects all of my design career. So, I mean, I, th I just looked at my house, and even though it was daunting, I said, I can do this. Well, you don't know how many nights that first month that I was trying to do it on my own that I cried. And, I, I mean, a closet would make me cry, or a cabinet would make me cry, because, I, oh, my God, there's so much more to do. So I got really smart, and I made a call to my sister, one of my sisters, and I said, I really need your help. And I'm so glad you called because we'd love to come and help you. So then we had a girls weekend and we not only had fun, we got a lot done. And then my boys would say, well, how about if I bring up a couple of my friends and we'll help? Amen. So I don't think you can really do this well without a team. But for me, the goal is always to have fun at whatever it is that you do. And my downsizing journey was fun. And um, so if, if I can pass that on to anyone who's considering downsizing, definitely get a team. And also, you know, I come into the middle of this with clients where, you know, he wants to save this, she does not. <laughs> and so I, I mean, I'm not a counselor. So I am. Um, <laughs> you say that, but, <laughs> but I am. not professionally. I know, I know. So we have what we call the ABC list. It's a YouTube video that I created. It's a design process for downsizing that makes it very simple, very easy. And of course, there's always the harder items. And so, you know, when you, when you said before, you know, a lot of people have difficulty getting started. There are some methodologies that I would 
recommend, and, and one would be, um, I, you know, I call it the burst method, where, you know, okay, it's Saturday, it's gloomy, there's nothing better to do, I think I'm going to start my decluttering or downsizing, and, you know, get a bag or a box and, and pick one area of your house, and, you know, c go through something like kitchen cabinets or garage shelving or whatever, and just look at it and say, really, I can't believe I have all of this stuff. For my for myself, my daughter in law, she's this big and she's a, 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 she's Indian, and I I remember the very first day we started downsizing and she came in and she said, well, where do you want to start? And I said, well, let's start in the kitchen. I don't recommend starting in the kitchen, but I opened one four drawer cabinet and we looked at it and she she holds up four sets of measuring spoons and she said, Rita. Really? Do you need four sets of measuring spoons? I said, no. <laughs> so, so three went away, and I kept one. And so that's the process. You know, it's like step by step by step. But if, if you do the burst method, I, I like to work in increments of 50 minutes. And it's just a lot of energy during 50 minutes, and take a break. And if you still have energy, do some more. You know, you can create whatever burst method you want. But um, And then there's the box method where you always keep a you know, a couple boxes in a room, you go in and out of that room. And so there are so many methods, but, um, you know, whatever works for you. And for me, having people around me to laugh and to cry, um, cause that certainly, you know, certainly does occur. Um, you know, it's just having a team. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The, um, it, it's a, it, it, yeah, there are some, uh, I like that you raised up some, some real methods. Cause that's again, Getting started is, well, if I can put a box outside a door and commit that every time I walk out of that room, I'm going to take one thing in. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. seem like a big event, but at the same time, you get a little pat on the back every time you go out, right? I know. It's, I know. Uh, the goal, though, is to get it out of the house. <laughs> right. So I, in my ABC method, I have the C's. Uh, you, you go around and you mark a room or you know the entire house, if you want, with stickies. So you know you have an A, B, and a C. So the A, I love that piece. I don't know how I'm going to fit it in, but I, I'm going to keep it. The C list are those things that are going to go. The B lists are the harder. So if it, if it has a C on it, get it out of the house. Go donate it, you know, whatever you're going to do with it, sell it. But then you start to see the house get lighter. And all the A things are still staying. And then we have to make sure that the A things do fit in the future space. Um, and you may not know what that future space is, but to the point of our conversation before, if, you know, if you're going to be a two-bedroom apartment or house or a three-bedroom apartment or house, we can pretty much anticipate that's not going to fit. It's not going to look good, or it will. And so when you have facts and you look at the CAD drawings and you see that that sofa is way too big for this smaller space, you know, people start to wake up and get real. And that's what we help them get real. Yeah, yeah, because it's just a piece of furniture. Yeah. And again, if you've been buying things your whole life, you can buy a different one and go through that experience that's, and get a brand new one again. That's, I guess, yeah. the other is the, is the trying it. Mm -hmm. Even if you get rid of too much stuff yep. and you buy a couple of new things in its place, not the end of the world. Yeah. <laughs> There's nothing worse than moving with too much stuff. You know, and we've probably all done it. For me, I mean, I moved from a... a very large townhouse to my bigger house. And, you know, how did I have stuff in my basement for 10 years that I had no idea what was in there? It came from my other house. Why didn't I deal with it then? Yep. You know, Stephen Covey has that, that methodology of, you know, when you go down to the, the basement and you see the same box year after year after year, open the box, find out what's in it, and then free up your headspace, you know, from, oh, I dealt with that box. That's where I found my son's shorts, my yeah. soccer shorts yeah. and... Yeah. So yeah, just deal with it. And it usually has something to do with you. You weren't ready to, to deal with it then, but now it's not, it might be time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you've obviously really lived this whole experience. Mm -hmm. um, so what's so on the emotional side of it for you, uh, Rita's a different person now, I'm guessing, than you were five, five <laughs> years ago. Yeah. Um, for sure. Yeah. Tell me mm -hmm. about. Tell me about who you are mm. now relative to kind of mm. who you used to be. Mm. I'm truly living the life that I designed and a life that I love. So I have more time, more money, and more freedom. I've just written my book, new bestseller. 
um, I would never have had time to do that. Um, I wouldn't have had time to sit and think. I would have been having to get the yard done or something else done. But now that I live in my tiny jewel box apartment in Philadelphia, I literally have time and freedom. Another thing that occurred in this last um, <clears throat> quarter was that I was able to go to France for 30 days. One of my bucket list items was to go to the south of France for a minimum of 30 days and um, become a local. And that's exactly what I did. And we actually tested and prototyped a business model that we're using work three days and play four. So, you know, I could work from anywhere in the world, which is no um, big revelation to younger people, but to me, a baby boomer, it was a revelation to me. Yeah, I can do this. So um, that then, and, and the company ran just fine. We actually grew that quarter, and I, I'm ready to do it again. So what's different? I've never been happier. I'm at peace. I'm having fun. I feel very alive. Um, and nothing is stopping me from doing whatever I want to do. So <clears throat> I'm in my mid-60s, and... You know, I'll probably work till I just leave this earth. Um, because right now I'm so committed to other people understanding the impact of living with less. So whether you choose to downsize or choose to declutter or a combination of both, <clears throat> the reality is, and this was my experience as a baby boomer who um, bought into the bigger house, the bigger car, the more stuff, I bought into that. On the other side, I now have far less stuff, 95% less than I once had. And I've never been happier. So my message basically is, and it was in my TED talk, you know, downsize your life. Why less is more? So I have a very rich, abundant life with less. And that's my message. And for people who are interested at all in that, they can try it on a much smaller level. They don't have to be as radical as me. And I didn't intend to be radical. <laughs> I'm just not that kind of person, but, but it was pretty radical. And now, you know, it does wake people up to say, wow, that's a lot. But you know what? I wouldn't, I wouldn't change a thing at all. I would do the same thing. I might have done it sooner. And I, that's the only regret is that I didn't do it sooner. Yeah, so obviously, as you mm -hmm. say, you didn't intend to have this be as radical. Mm -hmm. But what to me that says is through the process you connected with your authentic self yeah. to know that this is really who you are mm -hmm. and you started that started to come into view which previously was probably it was all nowhere hit, on your radar. Under my right? stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it was in behind dresses and everything else in your closet. Well, you know, when you think about the life of, of a designer, you know, you're a designer, you should of course have a big house. You should have all this pretty stuff. And I did. And I feel really good about that. I used to own a building and have 11 employees. And, you know, we've done major projects all over the country. And I'm very proud of that. But what I'm most proud of now is that I have two happy, healthy sons, um, wonderful daughters-in-law, grandchild on the way. It's about the quality of life. So what I realize now is that all of that stuff and the big house and all of that was a noose around my neck. You know, so when I owned a building and, and the big house, all I was doing is managing all of that stuff. Now I don't have all that to manage. And now there's the freedom to pursue the things that really matter to me. And that's making a difference for others. That's a, it's, it's wonderful. It's, and, and as we talk about kind of in the, in the, the what's next for me phase <laughs> of life, mm -hmm. um, again, like you, when you have the ability to feel like you're able to help others, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. it's it's a th this to me is probably like you say this is the this is the most fun I've had in <laughs> in all of my working years, yeah. Yeah. right? It's I because you see is. such a need in people um, to be able to really truly help them in ways that matter um, is mm -hmm. is a real gift that that we're given if we're bold enough to take it. And there are so many ways to help people, right? And if we look at finding our purpose. Yeah. Um, and, and establishing what's our legacy going to be. Like after, after you and I are gone and they look back at us, um, right. it's right. probably not going to be the, the things that we did inside people's right. homes, right? It's, it's right. ultimately going to be 
what are the lives that we've touched in, in meaningful ways that, uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that their families would remember you know, mm-hmm. them for having mm-hmm. made those choices and things. So, John Maxwell calls it the why that makes you cry. And that really touches me because when you have discovered your purpose, I mean, you can actually cry. You know, when you know you're changing lives every day, um, you know, I, I speak around the country now, and there have been times where I got teary on stage because I'm seeing people, you know, kind of like doing this, and I'm crying too. Um, but I said, that's, that's really what this is all about, is what can we do? I mean, you know, it, at 60, the longevity economy would suggest that we're going to live that 25 to 30 more years. And my question becomes, like, what are you going to do with your next 25 to 30 years to make a difference? And I, I work with a lot of baby boomer women executives who have, you know, had their names on the building or certainly their names on the door. And yet, when they retire, they don't know what's next. And it's very scary for them because it's an identity crisis that occurs in your, in your 60s sometimes or 50s where, you know, you realize you're going to live quite a bit longer and you can retire financially, but then what are you going to do with your life? And um, once you discover that, and that's, you know, part of the work of lifestyle design is we help people discover that, the why that makes them cry. Yeah, that's, mm-hmm. uh, it's wonderful. And it, yeah, we, we see that they have the resources to do mm-hmm. any number of wonderful things, but mm-hmm. there is a, a phase to go through of mm-hmm. stepping away from that mm-hmm. former self to say, yeah. long enough and have the courage, right, to walk away from that, courage. or at least yeah. to step away and yeah. give yourself some space to yeah. look at it and say, what else would I like to do mm-hmm. in this life? And, and mm-hmm. I've got 25 or 30 or more years sure. potentially. Sure. Um, why not why not go after it yeah why not right yeah, um yeah. because that's yeah. a lot of this is when we've already done things we've checked them off to continue to do them mm-hmm. um we don't get any medals for yeah you did a great job cutting the grass <laughs> <laughs> for four hours every weekend yeah. um for yeah. 60 years so yeah, yeah. To, to be able to do something meaningful and and it's fun which your obviously experience it is fun to do something different and and generally less risk associated with trying new things at this point in life Mm -hmm. than it is Mm -hmm. when your your kids are in school you got mortgage payments we don't have all of those responsibilities anymore so it is about reimagining reinventing and redesigning our lives and i'm totally committed to having people understand they can actually design their life you know, you have to be willing to do the work. But very similarly to if we were designing a home or a building, there is a design process that we can ha- can have you walk through um, to help you design the life that you love. And, you know, the, the question becomes, like, if you have that opportunity to design something you really want to, to live a life that you want, why would you choose this? And then the other question becomes, if not now, when? And it, it breaks my heart to think, and I had a, a, a recent situation where a client, um, the, the parents bought this beautiful property on the beach. For some day, we're going to build that house. Well, some day for them didn't come. One of them got seriously ill. The property still is there, and that home was never built. But the goal was that the family could all come and gather and everybody would be at the beach together. Some day isn't a day in the week. And it, it may not come. So if not now, when will you do whatever it is that's on your bucket list? And, and for me, that 30-day journey to France, it almost didn't happen. You know, last November, I had this <laughs> awakening that said, you know, I'm suggesting everyone else do what they want, but why is that? It's been high on my bucket list. Why does it keep getting relegated to the bottom? And it made me say, no, now is the time I'm going to, I'm going to do this. So, you know, December came and I started talking to my family about it. Then January came and I talked to my team about it. And my team did not say, Rita, you're crazy. My team said, okay, how can we make that happen? So we put some, some technology and some systems in place for me to be able to leave for 30 days. And then April came. And I was thinking, this is crazy. I can't leave my company for 30 days. What am I thinking? And so 
all of those little voices that go on in your head to stop you. And thank goodness I said to myself, if I don't do it now, when will I ever do it? And if I don't do it, what would my life be like? All I know is I don't want to live a life of regret. And that's the last thing that I would want anyone to do. And it's all about choice. It does take courage. It takes boldness to live on those skinny branches sometimes. But it's where the life really is existing and challenging and fun and exciting. And, you know, so why wouldn't you choose that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can, uh, can you show us your book? Sure. And just so sure. we make, make sure that... Okay. Uh, Okay. People get a good look at it. and So uh, well. my book is called Downsize Your Life, Upgrade Your Lifestyle, Secrets to More Time, Money, and Freedom. It is on Amazon, and you can reach me at ritawilkins.com. And um, I was very excited this week because our book became an Amazon bestseller. Awesome. Never, never awesome. expected that before. Awesome. <laughs> yes, that's, 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 that's terrific. Well, <laughs> congratulations. You. It's a, and and <clears throat> I read it. It was... A, it's a really interesting, you know, having come in this space as well. Mm -hmm. um, that is not an easy book to write. To write, um, You did a great job writing it in a blend of the emotional aspects you touched on and the practical aspects of s okay. somehow do, how to, but you know, how to books can get boring pretty quickly. <laughs> yeah. um, so it's a beautiful blend and written very nicely. It, that's a, mm -hmm. pick that up and read it over a weekend. You'll absolutely mm -hmm. get a lot out of Thanks, it. So Scott. I'm, it was a pleasure. That matters. I appreciate your comments. Yeah. Well, thank mm. you very much, Rita. Mm. This has been so informative, um, and I think uh, you know our students are going to get a lot out of this, and uh, and I'm sure they'll, they'll they'll get more out of your book and uh, and what what's what's to come next. <laughs> I'm now speaking around the country, and um, we'll be doing some corporate retreats. Um, I, I I I don't know what's next. Um, we are going to New York in two weeks to a publicity summer where we'll be interviewed by national media. So I would love to start some kitchen table conversations around the country to discover what people are wanting and needing so we can look for gaps and then fill that gap, you know, in terms of what are they doing next in their life. And um, I'm a believer in, in great conversations and um, listening. And then how can we help um, have people have better lives, design lives. <laughs> Great. So it sounds like so. if there's a forum for mm -hmm. someone, you know, a mm -hmm. group of people to bring you in or someone, mm -hmm. someone usually has to spearhead it yeah. to kind of have a roundtable discussion yeah. and kind of get some, some thoughts out on the table. That, that sounds like that, that would be you of know, interest. Um, as, as a designer, you know, we're always full of ideas, right? That's what you do too. And, um, there's nothing better than having conversations to have this one idea grow right there in front of you and then to um you know so it's ideation basically and then prototype it see if it works or doesn't <laughs> right because yeah. Di yeah. different models yeah. work for yeah. different people but yeah. they also in different communities Absolutely. have different Absolutely. different mixes that works well so yeah. it's and that's the beauty of all this is there's no one size fits all it's absolutely right. a personal solution that yeah. uh, yeah. that you're after so that's yeah. wonderful thank yeah. you so much again this was uh, mm. this was wonderful thank you i appreciate it and i and good luck to you thank you thank <laughs> you